Welcome to today's live, guys. Setting up the main camera there. Uh, what am I doing today? What am I doing? I am stitching in a welt onto a gusset. So this gusset will be going on a small handbag. And but it's going to be stitched onto a welt, first of all. A welt is simply a, a strip of leather that goes on around the outside of the gusset, similar to a welt that goes around a shoe, like on a Goodyear welt, for example. It's a go-between. Hello, everybody joining me. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, quickly show you what I'm doing. So this here is the gusset on the inside. So you have a little D-ring here, which is where the strap attachment is going to go. So this is the gusset for the side of the bag. And the welt is a strip that goes all the way around the outside. And right now I'm stitching the edge of the gusset onto that little strip welt. And then that welt is stitched onto the bag. And it gives it a more of a 3D look. It can make installation a little bit easier as well. It's slightly more time consuming, and I'll give you that. But installation is somewhat easier. But yeah, completely different look to it. So if you want to change up some of the techniques you're using on your bag, wrong way around, uh, welted gusset is actually really fun to do. It sits the gusset a little bit further back into the bag, not by much, but just enough to give it a unique look. So stitching this in at uh, 2.7 millimeters, thread I'm using is about 0 0.4 millimeters thick. So quite a uh, small stitch. And whenever you're doing this, because the, the seam is actually turned outwards, you're actually looking at the inside of the seam from the outside of the bag, you want to have a little bit more tension than normal, not too much, but a little bit more than normal. And that way, when everything is all stitched together and the bag has been built, what you want to avoid is seeing any stitches right on the inside. So adding a little bit more tension than normal, but not enough to cause any you know, puckering or shortening or anything like that. A little bit more tension just prevents that from happening. Uh, quite a few people joining in. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining in. Hello from Germany. Hello from the United Kingdom. So coming up to the corner, corner is always a, a tricky one for a lot of people, uh, especially if you're trying to match up holes that you've pre-made on the outside versus holes that you've made on the inside. I prefer using an awl, and especially in this, in this particular circumstance, and I'll explain why. The inside of the welt is not actually going to be seen. So it's a great opportunity for people who aren't particularly proficient with the awl to use it in a project practically because the inside, I'll show you what I mean by the inside. This part here is not actually going to be seen. It's going to be laying against the bag. I mean, you can always pull it back and have a look at it once the bag is complete, but this strip here isn't going to be seen. Still a good idea to try and keep things neat. Always good to practice your technique. But if you want to use an awl on your bag, but you're worried of what the rear side is going to look like, this is an opportunity where it really doesn't matter. So you can get some practical practice in at the same time. But again, even when you're practicing or even when you know that it doesn't matter, you always want to stitch like it does matter. Remember, details make perfection, guys. It's all in the details. But if you make an absolute hash of the rear side, as long as the front side looks, uh, looks pretty decent, that's okay. And the benefit is you don't have to match up the holes, which makes it a little bit easier. So as I'm going around the curve on this inside here, the outside stitch spacing is actually going to increase while well, the inside stays the same. And in this particular case, 2.7 millimeters. Hello from New York, Long Island. Hello, I hear you make some really good iced tea. Just 
just scrolling down. Uh, da, 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 da. What stitching chisel did you use? Uh, looks like a three millimeter distance. Hello from Hungary. Uh, it's not three millimeters, very close actually, good guess. I'll show you what it is. It is the, uh, it's the set that I got from Kevin Lee and it's uh, 2.7, 2.7 millimeters. I forget what they call this particular model. It's the higher end one. Yeah, it doesn't say, it just says Kevin Lee leather tools on there. But that's the one I'm using for this. Uh, very, very sharp. In fact, going around the corners uh, with the two tooth iron, which is really what it's for, for a tight curve, uh, don't really have to hit it with the iron, you just press and it cuts through, which is quite handy actually. So coming into the corner now, can get caught sometimes, especially on a small gusset such as this one. Uh, best regards from Indonesia. Oh, nice. I've been there before. All right, apologies guys. Hello from South Korea. Hello from the United Kingdom. All right, so we're right into the corner here. And I don't have to worry about matching anything up. I can just simply follow that stitch line, follow that seam all the way around, adjusting. So I'm bringing my all over and around. And once I get to that halfway point, or about halfway, I can then adjust it into the clam. So one more stitch. Keeping tension nice and tight because this is a high stress area. Because the last thing you want to do is open this out to stitch it to the bag and on the inside, right inside there, you want to avoid seeing these little stitches every so often. That's something that doesn't really look great. Now luckily these clams are small enough that I can get the end in which is quite handy. Hello from Jakarta, Indonesia. Been to Jakarta a very long time ago. Uh, I arrived there to tour Java and uh, it was right in the middle of a flood, which was uh, quite eye-opening. Beautiful modern city. And uh, it was... <laughs> Before the days of uh, mobile phones, you know, going back a long time ago, or at least before they were really popular and everybody had one. And uh, my family didn't hear from me for a few days. And uh, <laughs> we were traveling around and they were just getting news of the floods in Jakarta and that part of Indonesia, and they were very worried. <laughs> All worked out in the end, it's quite the adventure. Yeah, beautiful country. I think Jakarta has actually changed quite a bit since I was there. I can't even remember. I was in my early 20s. So coming on to the, the base now. This is slightly curved. Just a mild curve on there. So again, the bottom part, the bottom part, the strip, the welt, also isn't seen in the bag and uh, you won't be able to get to it anyway. So the only thing that matters in this, even though I'm giving it a bit of a cast, the only thing that matters is that front side, which is going to be seen. So every time you open the bag and look inside, this seam on the inside that you're looking at as well is what's, uh, what's going to be visible. So you want to make sure you do the best job possible. A lot of people ask about this awl that I use quite often. This is the Jerome David Titanium awl. So I got this from uh, Rocky Mountain Leather Supply. It's one of the more expensive awls. Uh, it has titanium parts, so it's a little bit lighter than something that would be uh, have a you know a brass ferrule or a, a steel stainless steel ferrule, which is the front part of the awl. It's uh, yeah, it's very expensive for an awl. It's around a hundred dollars, I think. Uh, euros, you can buy it in Europe, in France for about, I think it's about 80 euros. Some of them have started to get a little bit more, a little bit decorative, overly decorative I find. 
I actually prefer my tools to be plain, function first, form second. I'm not a big fan of what I term uh, Gucci tools. <laughs> tools that are really designed to look amazing and uh, their function is secondary. So, But I really, really do like this one. But it can be a little bit expensive for some. But if you're, if you're doing this for, a, you know, especially a business, selling leather goods, and you're using an awl quite often, uh, it's definitely worth the investment. Perhaps not if you're just starting out. I will confess, it's probably a little overkill, but it would make things easier for you. I miss what you're working on. Is that part of a bigger handbag? Yeah, I'll show you uh, the handbag. So the gussets, uh, excuse the ribbon on the top, the gussets will actually be going into the side here. Okay, so it'll be inserted into there. And when you open the bag, you can see a little pocket on the inside. So that's where these welted gussets will be going. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's part of the main bag. Uh, scrolling up, I think we had another question. Uh, do you use a lining? And if you do, what kind of cloth is mostly used? Well, I don't always use cloth uh, or fabrics for a lining necessarily. This particular lining is in fact uh, goat skin. Might not be able to see it on camera, but it's a very, very mild pink, very light pink, almost white. Uh, very durable, it has a surface finish which makes it a little easier to wipe down. But uh, for cloth, for, for bag linings, if I'm using a, a fabric, it's most likely going to be canvas, which is quite traditional. But there is a blog that I have on my website, on my website leathercraftmastercloth.com, and click on the blog. For those on Instagram, when this live is finished, you can go to the link in bio, and there in the menu you can scroll down and get to blog. And what I do is I discuss different types of bag linings, where they will be used, what they're more appropriate for, the pros and cons, uh, some things to avoid with bag linings and some things to gravitate towards. Uh, I really do like goat skin. I also like suede. That's a little harder to clean and canvas. But if you go onto the blog, you'll see a lot more about it. It goes a lot more in depth. So if you're looking for more information about bag linings, leathercraftmasterclass.com blog is the place to go. What's your favorite can't live, live without tool? What's my favorite can't live without tool? I mean, an easy one is to say an awl, but then I'm like, what about my skiving knives? And then of course the round knife, the epitome of all leather craft tools. Um, but if there's one tool that gets me really excited, I'll show you. It's very simply a vintage pricking iron, a vintage pricking iron. And if anyone knows anyone who's got a number five J Dixon vintage prick and nine obverse rather than reverse, that's, uh, that completes my, uh, my collection. I actually missed out. Someone sell, sold one on eBay uh, recently and then uh, one of my students alerted me to it. I put it in my saved and I never got the notification come through and I missed it and it went for something like 20 pounds. I was like, oh, it was such a good example. I was so upset. <laughs> But yeah, I guess it, it, these, these things, I just love the vintage look. I don't use them very often, to be honest with you. It's more of a, a collector's thing. Some big cases, I will use them. Like the, uh, the video course, the Bloomsbury Attaché case. I did actually use a vintage iron on that. But yeah, if I can't live without, not because it's, uh, I use it all the time, can't live without, but I can't live without because it makes me excited, as you can probably tell. But uh, yeah, I practically can't live without probably a skiving knife, to be honest. Probably a skiving knife. I wouldn't say I'm a collector of them. I do have a few, but I like making them as well from just uh, plain bar stock. They're not too difficult to make, to be honest. So coming around to the second corner, I'm gonna turn it in now. Hello, Philip, when will you release the last part of the Lizzie Bag course? Uh, ch -ch 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 either, believe it or not, tomorrow night. Uh, it's usually between the 8th and the 10th of the month. The goal is always the 8th, but if it's a complex build or it's taking time and there's tricky parts and things like that, sometimes it's the 10th. The aim is always the 8th, um, but it's usually between the 8th and the 10th. 
I don't necessarily like writing it down as it, you know, most of the time it is the 8th that it gets released on. Right, so we're past that corner. Or we're almost past the corner. So I've switched it around in the clams now. Again, keeping that stitch relatively tight. Not so tight that it's puckering the leather, but tight enough that it really pulls those two pieces of the exterior leather together to avoid seeing anything in the corner. You know, it's a little bit like uh, if ever you make a flipped bag, you know, a bag that you stitch inside out and then you turn it right side out. Uh, a lot of the time you'll see piping accompanying that in, in more luxurious leather bags. But if you haven't stitched tightly enough, when you flip it, you'll see the little lines of all the, uh, the thread going through from the stitches. And that's, uh, that's a sign that you haven't pulled those stitches in tight enough. So there's, there's a balance, it's a skill, it's practice like anything. Uh, question here from Headcase Leather, that's a cool name. Uh, what grind angle do you find works best on your skiving knives? Uh, I've always gone for 13 degrees, um, which is, you know, 12, 13 degrees, which seems quite, you know, quite shallow. But it also compensates for the stropping that you're doing, which very mildly starts to round the edges, you know, which is difficult to get around. So if you start from a slightly tougher 15 degrees and then it starts to get rounded, then, you know, you will find shortly afterwards you're having to use more force to skive even though you know it's hair popping sharp it's just not cutting through like butter so yeah 12 13 degrees which is quite shallow with a good quality steel it's it will take it uh, a good example of that is probably this one i made this one from high speed steel so that's a 13 degree on that one uh, a little goat skin wrap on that I believe I have the same on my Blanchard Skyver knife. Again, this is high speed steel as well. Uh, really, really good edge on this. Uh, I find you can get, this is probably commercially my favorite Skyver knife that you can get. I've, I've had quite a few various different brands and this is my favorite. It doesn't come Skyving sharp though. It's one of those that you, you kind of have to know how to sharpen in order to get the best out of it. Uh, I do have a video course, uh, uh, I was going to say techniques of the edge then, no, techniques of the blade, techniques of the blade. So that's a course where I teach how to sharpen. The difference between a skiving sharp knife and just a sharp knife is a completely different league. It's one of the basic skills that every, everybody should know how to sharpen uh, a skiving knife. To get the best results because when you when you have a knife that is truly skiving sharp it makes it enjoyable a lot of people dread having to skive or they change the designs of their projects to avoid having to skive and that's a real shame because they're not quite living up to their full leather crafting potential if they're doing that and all it needs is the right knowledge on how to sharpen crucial crucial in my opinion almost as important as, as knowing how to stitch, in fact. I think people underestimate the amount of knife skill that uh, Leathercraft actually needs. So just going through comments, making sure that I haven't missed anybody, I don't think so. Apologies if I have missed anybody's question or comment. It is not intentional. So almost coming to the end now, so a little bit, a couple more inches. So the exterior leather, I don't know if I mention, is a glacé kid skin. So kid skin is actually a small goat. Somebody's eating them, it's not me, but whatever the case, their skins are available. And uh, glacé kid skin is uh, a, a version of kid skin where it's polished. So it has a, a greater shine. You'll see that here. So it's not a surface finish is buffed to that finish. And it catches the light. It's a very, very fine grain. If you look at it closely, you can really see that it is truly a, a goatskin grain, but it's smaller, tighter, and with that polish, very, very subtle. 
I really do enjoy working with it. It's chrome tan leather, but it's, uh, it actually handles very much like vegetable tan leather, in fact. Or at least uh, semi-chrome combination tanned. Uh, any advice on how to sharpen a hole punch? Yeah, I did actually. <sighs> I did actually have an Instagram video on me doing that. Um, yeah, I think you'd have to scroll quite far down, probably uh, three, maybe even four years worth of scrolling to find it. I actually have a technique where I, I chuck it into a drill press and sharpen it as it's rotating. But there are sharpeners specifically designed for uh, sharpening hole punches that you can purchase. So for example, for those of you who don't know, that's a hole punch. So you can punch out a piece of leather like so to create a hole in what, for whatever reason you need to. Uh, yeah, I, I spin it and I have a, a diamond plate and I just very carefully as it's spinning do that. And I mark the edge with a little bit of Sharpie, so just uh, some permanent marker. So I actually know where I'm removing metal from. Now you can see some of the sharpening uh, devices are actually like a cone. So you have one for the outside where you put it into the cone and, and turn it, and it sharpens it from that angle. And then one which goes inside, so you get a, a V cone going on the inside. I would caution against doing that um, because you start to put an angle on the inside. If there's a burr, you can simply remove it with a straight piece of sandpaper and just twist it and pull at the same time. So roll up a piece of sandpaper, put it inside, let it expand, twist it, and then pull, and that should start removing the burr. Because the cutting tip is actually tighter than the inside, which is the exhaust hole, okay? So when you cut it, it should fall out easily because it, once it gets past that cutting edge, it opens up so there's nothing holding it. When you put a V sharpener on the inside, you start putting that angle and you lose that benefit. So only sharpen the outside, remove the burr from the inside. I hope that wasn't overly complicated. Uh, question here. Uh, I am a hobbyist, so I'm just gonna move this because the light color of this with the white writing, can't read it. There we go, that's perfect. I am a hobbyist, but I think there is no substituting a Bell Skyver. Does the Skyver machine require a lot of upkeep? Not really. I know you like your Skyver knives and I'm probably not that skilled. Um, does it require a lot of upkeep? No, but it does require a good amount of skill to not just set up, but also use. Um, you know, I'll plug my courses again. I do have techniques to the Bell Skyver, which is an uh, hour, hour and a half, and goes through the setup of how to set up your machine to get it going to adjust it, adjust its height for different thicknesses, giving examples of how to use one, uh, how to sharpen one, of course. Uh, it goes into a little bit more you know, in depth, but it gives you an idea of how to set it up and use it, which is what the course was designed for. But it, it's not that kind of thing where you, know, you have no knowledge on it, you set it up on the table, adjust it to the height that you want, put your leather through and everything works out okay. Um, it's going to take a while to figure out how to use the machine that way of doing it. Not even the salespeople know how to use them half the time. But um, upkeep wise, not really, you know, uh, probably every six months to a year. If I was doing more production, probably be a bit more often, but I will take it apart, oil certain parts, grease certain parts. Um, you know, just check that the belts are all in good condition and there's no fraying. Um, just give it a good going over to make sure everything's as it should be. But apart from that, they're quite, you know, they're quite bomb proof. They're quite low maintenance, really. So I would say upkeep wise, not really. But yeah, it's the, the prices of them these days, they're not over the top, I think, for what they are. And if you're a hobbyist, I mean, there are some really expensive hobbies out there that, that can really suck your money uh, way more than Leathercraft. So I think you know, spending anywhere from 500 to 1,000 or even 1,500 uh, on a good machine or secondhand German-made machine, I think they're, they're good investments because if you don't like it after a while, you can, as long as it's still in good condition, you can sell it for what you purchased it for. So it's, it's, 
you know, if you look at it more as you're just moving money over here and then moving it back, they hold their value really, really, really well. So it's um, surprising, especially the German machines um, like Fortuna, for example, or even Nippy of Japan, the secondhand value is, is very, very high. If you buy it secondhand rather than new, um, it's, you know, you can virtually get it back. Don't hold me to that, of course, but generally that seems to be the case. Uh, just scrolling up to get to the bottom of the comments. There we go, perfect. All right, so let's finish this uh, gusset off. And uh, I will be finishing the edges on this first before installation. So adding a, a welt onto the outside means that you're adding an extra edge to your gusset. So I'll be finishing it. Now you can finish it to the same color as the outside or you can finish it to the same color as the inside. I'm finishing it again as uh, a pink, a very, very light pink. And the stitching on this, as you can see, is a contrast stitch which matches the exterior, which is in this case a, a really deep burgundy, which I like. Let's move this forwards. Hola from Venezuela. <laughs> Hola from the United Kingdom. Few more left, almost done. And then I'll take it from the clams and show you guys what I've been doing a little bit closer. Keep catching that edge now because we're getting so close to the end. So I'm going to go to the end and then a couple of back stitches, good couple back stitches is really going to help with strength because this is a high stress part. It's the way you open the bag. So it will be pulled open all the time. Good sharp all. When we're close to the edge here. Makes all the difference. I can put that down now. And I'm do a couple of casts on there. So I'm really going to lock that in. So on both back stitches, just going back through and casting twice. It really puts a strong knot on the top. There we are, thread snips. Is it possible to get a close-up of the stitches? Yeah, sure. Just give me a second. To finish these, and there's my bottle, and in my round all. I'm gonna tuck these back in. So what I've got here is just a little PVA glue and I have it in a bottle so it's easier to apply when it's not blocked. So I use a small needle to unlock it if necessary. The good thing about this is it really pushes it in there. You just press it up to the hole, squeeze. And then when it comes out the sides, you know that you're, uh, you're in business. Just scrolling down to the bottom, there we go. Okay, so I can remove this now. And move that to the side. Now I've got these for the edges, but I'm thinking that's actually a little overkill, a bit much. So I'm gonna use some smaller duckbill pliers here. You can see I add a little bit of leather it goes over the edges and that stops any lines appearing when you really give it uh, give it the squeeze. Also helps in the corners. So I can turn and just use the edges of the pliers to nip those corners in. How does that look? That looks okay. So yeah, so I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that. There's the stitches going along there. You're never gonna get extreme angles in really soft leather like this. There's the rear side. Don't know if you're gonna be able to see that very well. But that is what we're looking at. So let's open this out a little bit more so we can tease it. So that is more how it's gonna be on the bag. So you can see the importance of keeping that uh, tension in the stitches so that you're not seeing anything on the inside. Can you see that? So there's no puckering or marks. So I'm just teasing this open now. 
And to give you an example, when it's stitched in place, if I can get it done on camera. Yeah. Obviously it gets glued in and then stitched in, but that's kind of how it completes it. So it's the side of the bag where we have these little attachments for the shoulder strap. So that is what I'm going to be working on next. So I'm going to be going back to filming now for the course, the Lizzie handbag, the Lizzie crossbody handbag part three, which should be out in the next few days. Uh, for those of you who subscribe to the masterclass. Now guys, I've been doing a lot of stitching in this and some of you might not be able to stitch at that at this point or know how to do the saddle stitch. So there is a new free video on the Leathercraft Masterclass. There's been an update. So don't forget to go to the leathercraftmasterclass.com and you'll see a little pop up there. All you have to do is put your email in and I'll send you immediately a course on hand stitching leather. And this isn't like a, a regular course because you're gonna see angles from all different sides. So there's double screens, there's views from above of how you would see the stitch. So it gives you a little bit more of an in-depth idea of how to saddle stitch and how to get the stitching results that you want. So leathercraftmasterclass.com, wait for the pop-up. You'll see it come up within a few seconds, enter your email and I will send you that to your inbox immediately. So don't forget to get your hands on that. Absolutely brand new. Beautiful work, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate the recognition. And all of you who join me on the live to watch me, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who ask questions and engage, really helps the live to keep going, so I appreciate that too. Uh, any questions or you wanna know a bit more about the masterclass or leathercraft questions in general, don't forget to DM me at Leathercraft Masterclass or send me an email, philip at leathercraftmasterclass.com. One L in Philip, guys. It's way more exclusive. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next live. Cheers, guys.